Gentlemen, what are we having for coffee this morning? Kurt? Unravel coffee, local roaster. Mark? I'm embarrassed to say I don't know, but it's dark. <laughs> That's okay. Mine's going to embarrass all of us. Matt, what do you got? I've got a uh, black and white uh, coffee roasters, Columbia. Uh, the, the, what is it? The Sisters Rivera, I think it is. So just got it in yesterday, so I'm still working on dialing it in a little bit. Well, so I'll embarrass myself. I'm drinking really, really bitter English, British uh, black tea. So I could not find coffee in my shop this morning. Um, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Ask the, Ask the Expert Season 3, Episode season, episode 3, Season 2 on Super Automatics. My name is Highland Joseph. I will be your moderator. We'll be discussing Super Automatic Basics, and then we will allow 20 minutes for Q&A. We'll provide listeners with contact info if you have any further questions or comments. We will also provide a copy of the presentation with an email we provide at the end of the episode. The Ask the Expert series is for the general public. This is our second season. The new season will consist of 10 episodes. We're committed to presenting these episodes throughout the year. So save Fridays at eight for the Coffee Tech Guild and Ask an Expert. We'd also like to announce our Ask the Expert Pro series, where we take some of our subjects and go into deep detail. Me and Matt Martin, who's on the board, will be doing capacitors for our first episode. If you're a Guild member and you're interested, please reach out to me and via Slack, and we'll get you invites when we do the webcast and we do the question and answer session. Let's get started. So we have to do our standard disclaimer. The presentation is for informational purposes only. The views and opinions expressed in this webcast are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or positions of any aspect of the Specialty Coffee Association or the companies and the panelists that they represent. Our panel is, we're gonna do a quick walkthrough. Matt Martin, introduce yourself. Hey, uh, Matt, I'm from Vixo. Um, I deal with anything with tech support, uh, training, um, all sorts of things. Kind of have my hands in a lot of different aspects of the uh, coffee technician world right now. And Mark Roby? I'm uh, Mark Roby. I own uh, Espresso Tech. We're a medium sized uh, service and repair company, coffee only. We primarily focus on super automatics. And Kurt Benedict. Um, owner of Last Man. I'm also a leader member of the Leadership Council for the Tech Guild. Um, just focused on technicians. That's my goal. I, we I like working with technicians and working on machines. Thank you, gentlemen. My name is Highland Joseph. I'm West Coast Service Manager for Espresso Partners, who has kindly provided me the time to moderate this. We'll be moving on to the next 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 slide. So. We want to make sure that we're clear about something here. There's over 100 different makes and models of super automatics currently on the market. The machines themselves can be incredibly complex. It's one of our, it is literally one of our fastest growing aspects of our industry. To that point, we will not answer questions about specific manufacturers. Our goal today is to give the audience a very general intro on how a super automatic machine works, answer any questions that you might have, and hopefully you'll walk away learning something. Mark, I'm going to turn it over to you for what is a super automatic espresso machine. Thanks, Highland. So for the most part, again, this is just a very generic overview, but a super automatic machine really is a machine that it's uh, everything's incorporated inside the machine. So we have the grinding, the tamping, the brewing, the extraction and the uh, disposal. We can also take the machine and do the milk process as well through um, where we can create the drink all as one uh push button if you will and so um you have the difference between the one step and the two step and it's a fairly simplistic process one step is all one process happens at the same time and two steps we still have an operator input where we can uh let the machine brew the coffee and then the operator can or the barista can uh, steam the milk and then do their uh creative blending of the drink highland uh some of the differences between hey, the yeah I have, a, I have a quick question can you speak yeah. to modular machines on that on that slide really quickly just walk through what a modular machine is a modular machine mm -hmm. uh so uh super automatic on a modular machine <clears throat> what we have on that one is you can actually take the components out of the machine intact so we have a uh, essentially have a steam boiler we have what we call a hydraulic module or the coffee tank, and then we have a mechanical module or what would be the 
the grinding assembly. And on a modular, truly modular machine, we can simply pull that, extract that entire assembly intact, the whole steam tank assembly control system, pull that out and set it off to the side and then be able to work on that uh, independently of the uh, machine. And, and in some cases, we can still have the machine operate uh, on there uh, at the same time. But but that's that's a that, that that would be a fully modular machine. Okay, thank you. Next slide uh, is all yours. <laughs> the differences between uh, super automatics and uh, traditionals. Uh, super automatic. <clears throat> uh, I guess what makes it super is we can push a button uh, on there. Uh, a super automatic is able to be programmed uh, to different specifications uh, on there. It does provide a more consistent uh, drink quality on there. Uh, the drink will be roughly the same every single time because the machine can monitor uh, a lot of uh, the uh, parameters that go into uh, brewing uh, uh, coffee and, and the milk process on there. Uh, the super automatics have a built-in grinder assembly uh, that I just spoke of. Um, it will go ahead and uh, the grinder, it will grind, it will dispense into a uh, chamber, a, a typically a piston type assembly. Uh, on there where then it will tamp uh, on there. Uh, each manufacturer is a little bit different on how the grinding and tamping process works. Some are uh, require some programming and operator input uh, in the beginning programming stages. Others are fully uh, monitored by the uh, machine itself <clears throat> on there. Uh, the automatic milk process is either through a, uh, a, a suction process, the Venturi process, uh, where then it's then heated or uh, many of them are now going to an actual pump because the pump technology in uh, dispensing milk has gotten so much better uh, over the years, and there's such a great demand for it that uh, that has improved immensely um, over the years. Um, with a traditional machine that we've all worked on, I mean, they have much bigger boilers than a super automatic. Super automatic generally has, has very small boilers compared to that. Um, <clears throat> on a traditional, an operator has almost complete control over the machine on how they want to create the drink. Um, and they can also make lots of different drinks on demand, whereas with a super automatic, you may have a designated set of parameters that are programmed in and, and to you don't have perhaps a lot of different options um, on there. And uh, on a traditional environment, since we have the grinder completely separate, as well as the tamping process and the uh, implementation of the uh, brewing process, um, that is all uh, available to the operator to adjust on demand. And as we all know, uh, when the environment changes, the grind needs to be changes. And you know, there are some cases where a human operator is faster at making those changes than a super automatic can can make adjustments in, let's say, a little bit of an extreme environment where we have you know either high and low humidity during a one hour period or high and low temperatures. If you're say in a drive through um, and it's cold outside, and when you open the window to serve the drinks, you have uh, an immense temperature drop. Sometimes, sometimes uh, an operator can can uh, work past that a little bit faster than a super automatic. But again, that technology is getting so much better where that's almost a non-issue anymore. Next slide. Uh, hang on, Mark. I have a question, yep. um, and I think some of our viewers might too. So, walk okay. me through a really quick summary of how does an automatic milk steamer work? What are the basic principles behind it? Uh, well, an automatic milk steamer. Again, each manufacturer is a little bit different, but but. But and the gist of it is, we will draw milk out of a uh, out of a tube from a from a container, uh, usually a refrigerated container, located either next to the machine, under the machine, uh, or in some cases built directly onto the machine. And from there, we'll siphon that in uh, through a. Uh, again, it depends on a manufacturer, but uh, for for the purposes here, uh, most of them are going to more of a pump driven system. So just as like we pull water through. Um, into the machine. Now we're pulling the milk into the machine. And from there, the different processes are as the milk flows through tubing, you know, I typically will add steam to that to heat it up. And the steam is then very, uh, is controlled uh, with a uh, ratio to give us the, uh, the proper type temperature we want. And then in the middle of all that, we also uh, induce air um, as well to give us that frothiness. Um, to uh, so it's kind of a whole combination ratio. Um, it's a pretty complex process um, on there. It certainly uh, it, uh, when you go through it, it's much easier to put a milk in a pitcher and steam it on a traditional machine than try to go through the whole uh, super automatic process to figure out where everything goes and when you have problems with it, uh, where those problems are. Um, but that is for the most part where where most of the higher end super automatics are going is it is a pump 
uh, driven system. And then it's all ratios after that. It's kind of like, you know, a, a fuel system in your car. And Kurt, you have a question? Yeah, all actually. Right. So I was going to ask you to kind of go a little more in depth on the grinders, just kind of explain to our audience about what it's actually looking for when it's changing those grind. What is it, you know, could you just kind of describe for them what it's looking or what are the variables it needs to know I need to change this, I need to change that? So on the on the uh, grinding portion of it, and again, each manufacturer is a little bit different, um, uh, but we have to have one constant. And in most machines, at least that I've worked on, and Kurt, you may be able to input a little bit into this as well, uh, we have to have something that's that's a set point. So typically it is the uh it is the size of the uh, coffee puck uh on there and so that's our one that's our one stable uh piece of the pie on there and what we always what the machine does it tries to maintain you know let's say a uh you know a, an 18 gram an 18 gram puck and of course we have to measure that in in size so let's just say that's 24 millimeters so 24 millimeters of of uh, of coffee in our chamber uh, packed down is what the machine will look for and so because we can sense through the piston technology uh you know where we're at uh, on a stepper motor and a stepper motor is we just count the number of steps down till we hit resistance on there from there we can the machine can determine what size that coffee puck is and so from there if that's our one stable thing then the machine can then monitor everything else so based on that coffee size puck then we can determine, uh, we know our water pressure that's going through because we monitor that. And then we, the machine can monitor, uh, and again, this is not all machines, but, but in general, uh, the machine then can monitor the timing on there and the operator uh, within programming will have determined what they want. So let's say for the sake of argument, it's 20 seconds. So we may have a plus or minus three, so 18 to 23. So as the coffee is brewing, if it stays within that range, uh, and again, we also, you know, we control the volume through a flow meter um, on there. So we know all of those parameters that happen. Well, when the timing then starts to go off, and that is kind of our gauge of when something needs to be adjusted there, the machine can then, then either compensate uh, for that through an automatic grind adjustment, if that machine has that feature on there, or it may ask the operator to input and say, hey, I need you to move the grinder a little bit coarser, a little bit finer. Once that operator does that, when it's been prompted to do that, um, it will then automatically know that you have, I have asked you to move at a certain uh, coarseness or fineness that is going to change the size of our particulate. And based on that, I've got uh, a uh, calculation that will tell me that now I'm gonna run my grinder a little less to give me either less coffee in there to achieve that standardized puck size or a little longer to give me that standard size puck size and hopefully then we'll reevaluate on the dispensing time on there. Generally, that's how a machine kind of monitors everything uh, on there and when it will ask for our input. Great question, Kurt. We're gonna move on to the next slide. Mark, slow down a little bit. When Sorry. You're talking. That's okay. Okay, we're gonna do modular machines and non-modular machines now. All right, so on the modular machines, uh, some are partially modular, but on a truly modular machine, as we talked before, the steam tank, coffee tank, uh, we call that sometimes the hydraulic tank, uh, and the piston assembly, all of that can come straight out of the machine um, intact on there. And we can work on that offsite um, for PM programs. If the uh, company is set up for it, it's great because you can PM the modules offsite, keep them in storage. Uh, and then when we go to do the PM, it really is a five minute swap. They have a completely PM'd machine, or in some cases, darn near new machine uh, to go up. And that really is a selling feature for that as far as uptime. Um, again, if we have a problem with the steam tank on a modular, a fully modular uh, machine, you can just swap out modules, the tank module, the steam module, and the machine is back up and running. On a non-modular machine, a super automatic, it's just like a traditional machine. So everything has its place, your steam tanks are mounted in there, your coffee tank is mounted in there, your, your piston assembly is mounted in there, your grinders are hard mounted in there. And then to work on them is not unlike a traditional machine. So if you need to work on the steam boiler, you have to work within the confines of the machine. If you extrapolate the boiler out of there, it's probably a lot of screws, some mounting, there's uh, wires, um, and that's a good time to take a lot of pictures. Uh, so that when you go to put it back in, 
uh, you make sure everything is in its place. Um, and with a super automatic, because we are looking at a small footprint, there are some manufacturers that there is a lot of a lot of things packed into a tight space and to get to let's say a steam tank sometimes we have to remove 40 percent of the machine just to get that component out and if you're working in a cafe environment that is a challenge um sometimes and especially if you're in a tight uh, tight space because it just takes a lot of work with a modular one you pull it and you go to a table um, or someplace uh, away from the machine and you can then do your work on it thank you we'll go on to the next slide there you go uh, so some of the similarities between the uh, super and the uh, traditional so so a lot of super automatic technology is is coming into the uh, traditional or what I like to call the super traditional um, machines and before machines were very mechanical, um, but PID is a good example. I mean, as far as I uh, have been working on them for 20 some years, you know, they have for the most part always had that technology because it's a board driven software driven system. Off the shelf temperature control devices are available or monitoring devices are available so they can read that temperature and then through, you know, relays and things like that. It's easy to, you know, close that window of, you know, your your, uh, you know, your start and stop temperatures and where you want to be within, you know, maybe a degree or two. Whereas in the past, say with a traditional machine, we use the old PSTAT, which we had a great uh, conversation on Slack uh, the other day about that. And that swing is much more, is much greater. And it's a, it's a manual uh, device uh, on there. And so you have, you have more obviously temperature stabilization. That's always been really in the super automatic world. Um, on there and that gravitated one of the things that gravitated into the traditional and I think you'd be hard pressed to find a traditional that that doesn't utilize that technology um, um, today. Kurt, you have the, a question? Uh, yeah. yeah, I was gonna, can you kind of go into a little, little bit about the boiler size and PIDs, just why it can matter a little bit since you're talking about that, uh, the temperature. Um, Actually, uh, Kurt, that's probably a little bit outside of my uh, abilities on there. I don't, I couldn't give you a good, uh, uh, you know, as far as a larger boiler or a smaller boiler um, on there, I, I probably am not uh, the right person to ask on uh, the differences on how it, uh, you know, how the a larger boiler would affect the PID type uh, setup as opposed to a, a much smaller boiler. I think that would be uh, somebody else, I'm sure will chime in with a little more expertise on that. Well, I just think more. We could just let our customer or let the let the viewers know that the PIDs can keep a larger boiler at a more constant temperature than the old P steps. That's kind of just all I was trying to get at. <laughs> gotcha. Well, but, you know, there, there's a question that I get asked a lot, a lot about the boiler size. Is what blows me away about um, the the sheer of oh, I said manufacturer. What blows me away about some machines is that they have that small flash boiler. Yet they're they're able to produce an incredibly high volume. Matt, do you have an input here? I just had a different question, but oh, okay. let's um, move on to Matt's question. <laughs> Go for it, Matt. Yeah. So, uh, do you want to just talk about a little bit more about how um, pressure profiling and kind of that big swing of things has started to really make its way into a lot of these traditional machines, and just the the amount of manipulation that you can start to do with just pressure alone and kind of uh, what you see going on with that right now. Uh, well, as far as that, I mean, uh, since we've been doing that in the, uh, not we, uh, since the super automatic uh, manufacturers have been doing that for, you know, quite some time, it, uh, you know, we're all looking for, um, you know, roasters and uh, coffee professionals. They're all looking for, you know, we want to get to an exact place where I'm brewing the perfect uh, cup and there are so many different parameters on there and temperature was uh, was one of them that uh, I mean early on um, you know back in you know David Shomer one of my most favorite people you know that guy's wrapping you know copper coils around uh, a Lamar Zocco group head to try to stabilize the temperature uh, because back then he felt that was extremely important in in the uh, brewing process so you know I think from there it's just been the demand of people that you know they want a better uh, you know, they want to eliminate as many of the variables as possible and temperature was uh, temperature certainly seems to be one of them uh, on there that they want, for the most part, an exacting temperature that uh, that can brew the, uh, 
you know, that can brew the coffee on there. Um, as far as the uh, the, uh, the the steam pressure goes, you know, the difference between the uh, the flash boiler and the uh, much larger boiler, you know, I think that the larger boiler is still a carryover from just the you know, traditional days uh, on there. It's, uh, Highland mentioned that manufacturer, which we won't, but you know, that boiler can really go all day. And that's probably one of the things I, I'm always been curious about is why we haven't been able to implement that type of technology, except that it may be a power related issue because on many supers we do, we do a power share um, because we have such a large, uh, you know, uh, 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 steam tank power that we want to really get that thing up to speed and keep it going. And to keep it under 50 amps, we'll do we'll do sort of a power share. So perhaps super automatics are they're not ready to to I'm sorry uh, traditional, perhaps they're not ready to do that, which which I guess enables a larger boiler to be somewhat more effective um, on there. But it's really just been a consumer demand, I think, and a manufacturer uh, demand to you know every day it's improving. Um, you know every year they come out with something you know new um, and. I feel like a lot of that comes from that super automatic technology, but even super automatics continue to improve on that temperature uh, profiling, uh, you know, through programming um, on there. And you're just, you just, I guess it's more of a, uh, it's more of just the demand of the consumer and, you know, they're willing to pay for it. Excellent. I have a question about pump pressure and monitoring. What kind <laughs> of pumps, what's the difference between the pumps that you're using on, um, on a, I mean, because we all deal with those basic rotary pumps. What's the difference between the pumps that you use on a super automatic and a pump that you use on a traditional? Uh, the ones that we work on, they're the, they're the same. The only real okay. major change has been the, you know, we've gone to more of a magnetic drive pump instead of the old, uh, uh, you know, shaft uh, with a key in it um, on there. But it's still the, I mean, it really is still the same manufacturers. You know, the pumps have gotten a little bit, a uh, little bit smaller because we, uh, we jam them in there and, uh, you know, pump technology, you know, it is improving, uh, I guess. I'm, <laughs> I still feel like it's a little bit in the, uh, in the stone age, um, but through, uh, you know, through some, some power type uh, apparatuses, we're able to, you know, control the, you know, the RPMs and things like that. But for the most part, a traditional machine, at least the ones that I deal with, and there may be other people that, that work on something I don't that have a different type uh, pump system, but uh, it really is the same technology there. Matt, yes, and Ed. Yeah, I just was saying, I, I just love looking at the history of things and seeing kind of where this pump pressure system is, where we're going from computer boards that are running these, you know, codes to get this ramp up and pressure from this old lever action, you know, espresso bars that are doing this ramp up and pressure. And I just love seeing the the transition of using technology in a way that hasn't been used previously and starting to find different ways of doing something that. That, that we found really um, amazing and really brought out really great coffee um, in a very traditional sense and then finding new ways to do it. So it's, it's a really interesting way that they're using technology to do those kind of things now. Okay, since I, I've got the two of you, I, I, have, I have a question. Matt, log on. Um, so all of us, every tech I know will say the same thing. The best shot they've ever had is from a lever machine. Best shot of espresso. <laughs> will super automatics be able to get there with current technology or soon without mentioning any organization <laughs> that, you know that's a really I, I, good question but you know what it's just like i have not I, I do, the best espresso on oliva uh but, yeah i mean, uh, i do i, I do a, i do i do a, a series with don burquist and my and mike tehan ask the expert pro that we're working on the other pros and one of the we did an episode on pressure and one of the one of the things we all brought up is like well what's the best shot you ever had and we all basically simultaneously said an old lever machine i'm I, i'm an old gotcha and literally every tech i've talked to is like i had this old lever machine from 1948 that i had the best shot ever it, so maybe what's will <laughs> my question is, is that we're going we're to cause some controversy here is will <laughs> super automatics get there and we know some of the organizations some are super super close but why what's the difference and why haven't we hit that sweet spot yet uh, so sweet spot of the best espresso out of a super get the quality uh, well i personally think the quality is there um, I think that, you know, on the, uh, 
uh, you know, on, on your, your Leva uh, machine there, the, um, uh, I have a feeling that the best coffee, you know, there were a lot of other factors involved in the environment where you're at, things like that. Um, there's still a lot of variables in one of those. I mean, uh, you know, it is, although you have a consistent uh, pressure going through there, uh, you know, those were, uh, you know, they were just a traditional machine. You also had the operator and the coffee and all of those different factors. I think with the super automatic machine, I mean, I tell people, you know, for the most part, if you, you know, let's say you're, you know, the best barista you got, the best coffee you can find, the, you know, everything is perfect uh, on there. Let's say for the sake of argument, that's a 10. Okay. So you can get that with that one person at that one time, you know, can that person replicate that over and over and over again, over a three or four hour period? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe they stay at nine, maybe they go to eight and a half, maybe they stay at 10 the whole time, but then the next person comes in line and are they going to make that? And so with the super, you know, you're at an eight and a half, you know, all the time. Uh, you know, are you ever going to be at a 10? I guess that's really a personal taste issue, you know, but I think if you're looking for a consistent uh, uh, type drink and uh, the manufacturer, uh, well, not the manufacturer, the roaster, you know, will take its time to, you know, develop a recipe that will dial that in. I mean, and, and, and Highland, you and I share a particular customer that they have, they're all in on this now. They, right. they feel that, that that drink is is the best, you know, as of the highest quality that they, uh, that a, a human could could make on there. And now they can replicate it over and over and over again in a, a much, you know, for a, a higher volume environment. And you know, that translates for them into, unfortunately, well, not, well, fortunately money, um, cause that's what drives a lot of things. But I, I think that, I mean, I honestly think that if the roasters will make the commitment, uh, I believe that we're there. Yeah. Okay. You guys, we, we need to be careful about discussing make and models and manufacturers. Um, mm -hmm. Mike Kahn from, uh, Mike Kahn had a really interesting point is the best coffee you ever had may have come from a lever machine, but more often than not, it was also the worst. So <laughs> that is actually a very valid point. So, <laughs> Mark, let's go to the last slide really fast and just kind of review some of your points here and then we'll go and we'll answer, um, we'll start answering questions. So go for it. Gotcha. Well, I can only talk to the U.S. market. The European market's completely different uh, um, on there, but uh, typically you found the super automatics in the food service sector, um, you know, cafeterias, uh, things like that, or in chain restaurants, you know, where coffee is not your main function. I mean, a, 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 like a bagel place would be a, a good example, you know. Their primary business is bagels, but their secondary and extremely important business is coffee. Um, but for them, that works in that typical uh, environment on there. Um, I think that, you know, uh, the coffee shops, the traditional equipment over the last 20, 30 years, you know, the, uh, the barista has really helped to grow the uh, specialty craft uh, coffee business um, on there. And it's really made people aware of better coffee um, and they want to drink better coffee and they're willing to buy and, and get better coffee. On the other side of it, technology, and, and obviously COVID is, is one of these factors, but even before that, technology has been, hey, let's order it on our phone so we can pick it up. I don't really need that human interaction. I don't want to go and hang out at a coffee shop. I really want my, uh, I really want my coffee. And so I think based on that, people are becoming, you know, less, uh, uh, more acceptive of, you know, a super automatic in a, in a cafe type environment on there. They're okay with that, you know, where maybe 10, 12 years ago, if a coffee chain opened or a coffee store opened, um, and they had a super automatic in there, you know, some people might be like, well, I'm not going to go there. No, they don't do anything there. Um, but I think now it's just becoming, it's becoming more accepted in that particular environment. And I think that coffee shop owners and roasters and, and that are also, uh, they're finding it to be more acceptable to, to put in places um, that you traditionally would have seen, you know, normal or, you know, standardized equipment in there. So I, I think it's more of a, a public and uh, uh, industry acceptance of it. That's all I got. Okay, I was muted. Sorry, I had a full paragraph there. Um, gentlemen, pop in. Let's go to questions. Matt, Kurt, come on. Okay, so we're going to ask two questions, and I want to hear from Matt and Kurt on this. Um, our first is going to be our robot invasion question. This is the most common question I get. Kurt, jump on, please. Is, will super autos replace baristas? And as text, we're going to have a good idea of, of, of that. So, Matt, let's start with you. I'm going to round Robin, and I'll, when, you're good, when you're done, I'll ask the next person. 
Yeah, I don't I don't think that's going to happen. I, there's a place and a time for everything and every different target market has a different interest level. I know kind of like what Mark was talking about is that every different environment has its own um, aspect of things that it brings and people desire to to seek after. Like um, right now I'm drinking a, uh, a black and white coffee roasters coffee right now because I love um, very interesting, unique roast profiles. Um, I tend to lean towards the light side of things, but that's what I like. You know, and not everybody is on that same page or not everybody desires to go to a store that um, that runs a super automatic. Likewise, maybe some people really enjoy going to that shop that they can uh, sit there and have uh, a hand tamped uh, shot of espresso that, you know, that's maybe more on the light side of things. And maybe that's something that's different than maybe they can get at a different environment or a different shop down the road. So I, I think there's always going to be a demand um, for different things and different styles of doing it. And uh, I don't think it'll ever replace them. I think it'll just um, just look different as time goes on. Thank you, Matt. Kurt, you're up. I and with Matt, I don't think they're ever going to be replaced because there's always time and place for the different machines. Like now, it's talking about the different profiles. It's not like a, a cafe can really afford to have eight super autos sitting on a counter to put all these different beans in, but you could have eight grinders sitting on a counter with different, you know, different origins, different grind settings on them for one traditional. So it would be too hard to have removed the barista because the barista needs to be there and doing the work on those eight grinders and hand tamping and keeping that art to it. So kind of as Matt was saying, it's just where is the point or where do, where do you place it? So the super autos will have their place and the traditionals with the barista will always have their place just because there's always going to be the person that likes that nicer quality or maybe if you're in a rush then you just go through the drive through line of some local place and just get a quick cup so there's always going to be that difference in place for everything yeah mark i don't think i think it's more a question of you know are they going to replace you know the barista the baristas are going to be there i think you're you know you're going to have your place for you know locally owned coffee shops like they were like Kurt and Matt were saying, you know, you're always going to have those, just like you'll always have independent restaurants. And so that will, you know, the, you'll still have that type of barista. I think you'll see a change um, in the barista as we, you know, as as super automatics become, you know, more common in the, the marketplace. I mean, I don't, I wouldn't discount somebody, I wouldn't disqualify them to be a barista if, you know, they did work on a super automatic machine. Part of being a barista is the you know, it's the customer service aspect of it. It is the drink creation aspect of it. I mean, I totally get Kurtz. Uh, you cannot, uh, in a super automatic, you can't throw, uh, you know, a new blend in at two o'clock and expect that thing to work without, you know, it's a full recalibration and, you know, some programming in there. It's not as easy. And if you have eight different blends on the counter and, and that is your, uh, and that is your business, uh, that's the only way to do it is to have somebody there. And that's a, you know, it's it's going to be a, a higher quality um, or a higher uh, a person that has more um, ability or is in tune to that as well. I think you'll just see a little bit of a uh, reclassification of what a barista is. But I mean, you know, in my opinion, I mean, it's still always 50 percent customer service. <laughs> so as right. long as uh, yeah. as long as we do, as long as they keep that, uh, I think you'll always have the baristas around. I just think that they'll as the technology changes, uh, you know, they'll just, they'll roll along with it, but there's always a place for them. What's, what's going to yeah, be interesting I, is like, I think that speed of service, like that's going to maybe change as like our, the way that the pace that we do life is different right now. It's um, very much uh, in demand. Like we kind of want our product as fast as we can, so we can get on the road and go do the next thing. You know, that's, that's kind of how our culture is right now. And Maybe it is that uh, yeah, we start to see those machines pop up a little bit more here and there. I mean, like there is a, a, a blender like machine that I was working on and I was like, man, this is crazy. Like I can go into the store and I can push a button. And I can get a smoothie. This is just bonkers. And uh, <laughs> the same thing, like I remember joking when I was with uh, a coworker. I've, I've worked in different shops for, for a long time now and um, and we we're like, man, it wouldn't be crazy if you just walked up and pushed a button and then everything just happened. This was like a decade ago. Um, I'm showing my age here a little bit. But then 
um, you know, now that's that's very possible. But at the same time, like what Mark was saying, like I think we live in a very relational uh, atmosphere around coffee. That's what it's always been based off of. You go to these old things where, like this brick old, like I have this like envision of like people going in and grabbing uh, coffee around uh, the business meetings back in the old days, even when they were doing coffee in a very rudimentary way. And it was very relational back then. And I think that's still the case now um, that relational coffee is, is not going away either. No, I agree. I think what we've seen, and this goes to an argument I've been having with some of my friends who don't get third wave coffee or don't get the different flavor profiles, the lighter and the more medium roast. And it really boils down to, there's kind of two types of coffee. There's drinking coffee, the coffee we have in the morning that wakes us up and gives us that go. And then there's the sipping coffee, the Rwandans, the single varietals, the new blends that you really sit down and you enjoy the cup. And I think what you'll see in cafes is, and we, we've already, we already have been seeing this with the adoption of third wave of 2006, is a real adaption of elevating the coffee experience. I mean, you go into cafes now and you're not just ordering a cup of coffee, they're providing a complete experience that includes great service. And service will become such an aspect of what we do moving forward. The snarky barista, these days are numbered. <laughs> you want a caramel macchiato, what is, is going away? So. Um, okay, we've got actually quite a, a good list of questions here, guys. I'm going to skip over the how to become a tech and we'll end with that. Um, here's one question that we could all answer. What's the number one thing a new owner of a super automatic overlooks when it comes to basic maintenance? If you guys don't get this, I'm going to be slightly disappointed. Uh, well, I'm going to step in and say, one, cleaning, but basic maintenance setting up the maintenance contract with your service provider exactly matt yeah just doing your cleaning cycles just rinsing things off um doing your basics really i mean it's um like milk in any way shape or form if it's left to sit in one place <laughs> where it's not supposed to be it's going to cause problems um <laughs> You know, it's, it's just taking the basics and like understanding the fundamentals of what the machine does and what it should not be doing. And I think, um, I think as long as you understand the maintenance, of kind of what Kurt was saying, I think you're good to go. Yeah. Mark? Uh, I think uh, the, I think one of the bigger things they miss is that they don't, they need to remind their staff that this machine is extremely expensive and not treat it like a tinker toy. Um, you know, we have, all three of us have seen countless Steam wand's broken, ripped right off the thing, a steam handle, you know, torn right off. Well, I, you know, how'd this break? I don't know. Well, I do. <laughs> you know, you, you treat it like garbage or, you know, you put syrups on top of the machine and it falls over and it goes inside the machine. I mean, I think it's just, you know, I, I think people just need to be reminded that this is a, a, a an expensive and powerful vehicle and it needs to be treated as such. And I, I find in most cases it's, it's treated pretty poorly um right. in in a lot of in a lot of different environments which is which is too bad but it also keeps all of us employed well i mean the, the point that i right. i always like to make is that when an owner tells me that you know, they're cleaning it every day and it's like as a tech we know you're not cleaning it every day so just stop telling us you're cleaning it every day because we have empirical proof you're not actually cleaning it every day that's why the, that's why it's a digital board and that happens more often i see it so much i'm cleaning it every day you're piston is covered in coffee oil that's not possible so it's like if you're going to clean it every day let us know you're cleaning it every day um nabeen um has an excellent question um and i'm gonna put his out there first do you think the role of the technician will change as super automatics and modular systems continue to progress um with technology and market share it's an excellent question Uh, I'll chime in on that. I, I think that you just, it's going to require more, um, you know, just a, uh, more uh, training. Um, you know, it is, training has been pretty, over the years, has been pretty loose um, as far as, you know, let's say you, let's say a manufacturer, you know, you get certified, you know, there really isn't, hasn't been generally a, you know, a yearly recertification. I mean, it's getting better now. You know, but since technology changes so fast, you know, a lot of times we get a, you know, a technical service bulletin, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, Kurt and I are probably in the same boat. I mean, 
when you get 50 of those a day, you don't read them. <laughs> you know, you just, you know, you call up and go, what's going on here? And they go, hey, we sent out a report. And you're like, whatever, just tell me what the problem is. Uh, you know, but I think that you'll see more, uh, uh, you know, the, the training's going to be more involved uh, to keep all of us up to speed on as the technology changes. And I also think that once we get on board with uh, telemetry uh, on there, that I'll be interested to see how that changes our role. Um, you know, if that really kind of goes to a parts changing type role of, hey, we already know what's going on, go change this part. Or if it is, hey, here's some troubleshooting help for you through telemetry and go, you know, help us figure it out using your knowledge. I don't well, know. <laughs> uh, no, it's good. It's actually good. No, th th those are all great answers. Uh, our compatriot, Maria Cleveland, who actually recently did the cleaning Ask an Expert, asks, what recommended setting the machine to stop and require cleaning after a certain number of cycles? Do you agree with that or not? I mean, there's nothing more frustrating than you're sitting there working on a line and you're making something with a super automatic and it goes, and it goes into, into a cleaning cycle. And then they forget to open the door, forget the process. What do you think? You're all just smiling. I think if you want to have it cleaned, you got to, you know, that that's the one thing we talk about cleaning. It, you know, the, most of the super automatics now, you know, they force you to clean it. We typically set that at a 24 hour period. Uh, you know, if we find that, you know, they're having some some issues with buildup, you know, that might move to, you know, twice a day um, or more. It really depends on, I guess, that particular customer on there. Um, you know, but if you're if you're doing a cleaning cycle in the middle of a rush, I would guess that I would have to assume you didn't clean it the night before and it's it's uh, yeah. it's timing you out and forcing you to do it. So, uh, you know, it pretty much tells us when they call and go, hey, this thing just goes into cleaning mode on its own. We all know, well, that's because you didn't do it the night before. Even, you know, like you said, Highland, you can we, we, we know you didn't do it, but now there's proof. <laughs> that you didn't do it. So, well, OK, yeah, let me sure. chime in, because typically with that one, like you're saying, set it for night. So I always, varieties of them. Um, I talk to the owners of the shop, say, when do you want me to set it? And, you know, they may try and say, oh, this or that. And I say, well, let's do it at nighttime. And then if you always want to run that extra clean cycle, please feel free to clean the machine, clean it. We love you cleaning the machine. And that's typically how I go with that one. Um, because yeah. you set it for shots like you're talking about or in the question, you're right locking out a barista in the middle of a drink may actually make the manager angrier at us than if we lock it out for time. Right. Vincenzo Adamo has a good question. Um, if you're looking to vet different makes and models of super automatic machine, uh, super auto machines, what are the categories outside of machine costs you would recommend focusing on from a service per perspective? As examples, heat heating mechanism, gram throw, max, and telemetry. What do you guys think? Mark, we'll start with you. You know, again, we don't really sell any equipment, but if somebody's asking me for a recommendation, depends on their environment. But, you know, I'm probably like these two. I'm going to gravitate towards, for me, who's easier to work with? Like, who can I get parts from? Uh, who's who? What tech support works best with me that from the back end, I know that I can fully support them and the manufacturer is fully going to support me. You know, that's, you know, if they're going to really ask my true opinion, you know, that's the machine I'm going to gravitate towards because that's the one I know I can support. Now, I have found that the companies that do that, they have the better quality machines and they're easy to recommend. Okay. Matt? I, I, yeah, I'm fully on board with what he was saying, too, because I think any kind of setup that you're doing, even if you're setting up a roastery or something like that, like I think you want to take into consideration those facts, um, regardless of what you're dealing with, because I think if you go into it and you get a, a machine that it's going to be all foreign parts is going to like no one in your area works on it like no one really knows exactly what it's doing i think those are things that are that that really are to be considered like mark was saying that'll make downtime and downtime in any kind of business is is really hard especially for small businesses um, especially in this time frame right now like any kind of income right now for potential small businesses right now is is crucial okay kurt um <laughs> See, this is where I differ because I actually do sell supers and I will kind of approach someone and say, well, what are you looking for? Are you looking for the single step, the two step? Are you looking for a milk fridge on it being the single step? Are you looking for what's your capacity? How many drinks are you trying to make a day? Um, you have to think of all the variables. What's your counter space? What's your um, power 
availability. So not requirements, availability. What does your shop have to supply that machine? Um, the telemetry, that's more up to, do you have a tech nearby that can work with that kind of telemetry? Because it's just one of those things. Now, if you're adding in telemetry, then you got to make sure there is a warranty and non-warranty provider for the telemetry system um, in your area. And that's even more. I talk about who's your warranty provider, who's your non-warranty mm -hmm. provider. Um, so there's a lot more than just to go, oh, I like this machine. It's what am I trying to do with it? How many drinks am I trying to serve? Yeah. What is my availability with space, with electricity? Um, what do I think my customers will like? Do they want to see at least a little of the barista flair by doing the two-step, you know, the make the shot, steam the milk separately, and then go from there? Or do they want to just get the drink quick? Do they want the one step where a barista is just hitting that button, handing them a cup of X? So it, there's tons and tons of variables. And I always like to actually tell people, talk to your roaster, talk to a service company, let them guide you on this. I think that's really good guidance because like I don't sell super autos either. So it's coming from somebody who does like that's really great insight and having somebody in your back pocket that can guide and direct them that way. Uh, I think that's huge. Daniel Clark, um, I was on mute again, had a whole conversation with you guys. Um, Daniel Clark, if super, automatic, if super autos replace a percentage of baristas, will they require as much maintenance from us techs or would you see the demand for our jobs diminish? Let's start with you, Matt. And me. You hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah I was going on and off on the uh, mute switch there. It's causing me challenges this morning. <laughs> uh, to clarify, so is it asking like with super autos being um, hey, Daniel, I, sorry. in the markets, is it going to decrease the amount of work that's going to be had for technician? Yeah. Question. I don't think so. Um, in any way, shape, or form. Honestly, I. I feel like there's so many moving parts on a super automatic. Um, there's so many things that are going on there. There's always going to be work for a technician. Now, um, you know, maybe if you have a higher saturation, like with what I do, like I, like I look at a lot of different numbers. And as you see markets that receive new units, um, there's definitely going to be a curve where you're going to see a curve and increase in calls as people get acclimated to their unit or like so that they're learning how to service it they're learning how to maintain it but then after time you might see that new unit kind of get into a very good sweet spot uh, after time i mean after years of use depending on the use uh, of that unit like it's going to need repair it's going to need service and um, it's only a matter of time so you might see a curve where maybe you have a downtick in the amount of repairs and, and maybe Mark and Kirk can talk a little bit about how that's impacted them too, because uh, they probably have seen those swings too. Mark? Uh, I don't think it'll diminish our job at all. I mean, if somebody can break something, they will. Uh, we all have seen it. <laughs> there's any way to break a machine, no matter what, they, it'll always get broken. The nice thing I like about super automatics is that most manufacturers are or, and even more so now, have been on board with routine maintenance. I mean, that's a, a lot of times you don't get that with a traditional, you know, somebody buys it um, and then they they don't really do any kind of preventive maintenance on it, or they might do it themselves with, you know, just changing gaskets or screens. You know, uh, for me, I think it's, and I'm sure Kurt would agree, I mean, there's really value to, you know, let's say going every three months and just popping the lid off the thing and looking for any leaks. I mean, that could save them tons of money, but they just, they typically won't do it. But manufacturers of super automatics uh, you know, and, and especially, and this is really in the environment that I work, which is more corporate type chains, you know, that is all a set program on there. So, you know, for us, it's uh, it's been really good and steady work um, on there. And then, uh, you know, they continue to make upgrades and changes as, you, as they're out in the marketplace. And that is, you know, opportunities for upgrade service, things like that. So I think it's just going to gravitate in towards, you know, we, you can't, there's nothing against plumbers. Uh, you know, but in the old days, you know, the guy who could do your plumbing could fix your espresso machine. You know, it's not going to have those these days. It's it's going to turn into a more specialized business. Uh, I don't think the 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 amount of work will diminish. I think it will just continue to increase. 
Gentlemen, we have a lot of really good questions. I'm gonna propose we go a few minutes over the time limit if you're okay with that. Um, I'd like to actually address these. Um, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go, uh, wait, uh, Kurt, what's your response on that on that last question? Sorry about that. No, you're fine, Highland. So you can actually, if you look at any technology introduction into a society, you will see there's always growth in jobs. And I look at that with the coffee industry and the tech guild. Um, the more you grow the super autos, the more that there is the need for that technician to come out and do the work for you. So like I look at it as, um, look, like, can I just compare it to the car industry real quick? So I was waiting for that. Yes, you can. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, if you see, yeah, One of you was going to do it. Um, it's like, if you look at cars, even though the car got more intelligent more intelligent it actually created the need for more and more mechanics and not shade tree mechanics actual trained licensed certified mechanics and i think that's the same thing that the tech guild is actually going through right now is we're growing that process of true certifications to make sure that the technicians are going out know what they're doing because the need is there and it's just going to keep growing like matt and mark had said it's just yeah. going to keep growing so Caleb, who co who actually also Caleb Bleach also co-produces the series with us, has a two two prong question. Do super automatics have the same expected life that a traditional machine has, and should the owner expect more maintenance for a super versus a traditional machine? Kurt, we're going to start with you. Typically, I will actually say I've seen more life out of traditionals. Now grinders and everything else, less life. Um, so supers, they get a good amount of life out of them. And this goes back to the time and place with the super, you'll need your technician. And if you don't have a good quality technician, you're not going to keep that, that machine running, or unless you are maybe possibly even a trained technician yourself or trained by the manufacturer to keep that going. But even then you're not gonna know all the aspects like someone like Mark, Matt, or I, or Highland that have been trained for years and this is our specialty, this is what we know. Um, we'll be able to keep your supers going longer, but honestly, I think traditionals last a lot longer, just the machine itself. Matt, your comments? I, I think I agree with Kurt a little bit. Um, hi, Caleb. Um, it's good to have you, back. but uh, I I think the difference is, is that there is so many moving pieces within a uh, within a super automatic. Like there's there's things that are moving in there. Like the environment just to press your coffee. Um, there's a, a specific motor that does that, you know. And then, like Kurt was saying, there's just so many different things. And uh, I think if you have, like what Kurt was mentioning, if you have a really great technician that knows their stuff and that you're actually going through and doing your preventative maintenance as you need to, like I think you can extend super autos for a really, really long time. Uh, I think you just need to have those two things down is have a good tech that knows what they're doing to work on it to keep it up and running and have you know your cleaning cycles and your maintenance down pat. Now, when I was traveling around doing maintenance in different places, um, like I could always tell when there was... Um, good cleaning cycles ran and when the technician you know was superior in that area because I could go in and my work would be um, a lot less in one area and then I'd go to another area and it'd be a lot more work and it's always one of those two things and I think if you have those two things you're in a good spot to to really keep your super autos for a long time. Mark? You know I think uh, both of them can last as long as you care for them. I mean, I think that, you know, most machines fail because of lack of care, but also, I mean, if everybody that owned a machine could hire Scott Manley to come, you know, uh, uh, get them set up on a, on a, on a water uh, system that would work for, for their specific environment. I mean, I, I think then we can all agree that, you know, water quality is really the, one of the main factors that degrades machine pretty quickly. I mean, you know, I have supers out there that are well over 18 years old that, you know, yeah, we have to change a part here and there. But again, if we go back to the car scenario, you know, a car will run forever. We have, you know, we have, we have, we have, um, we have Honda Elements. I love them. But they got, I got one with 700,000 miles on it and it runs like it's brand new. It's not free 
to get it there, it requires maintenance. And I think that machines require maintenance. It's not something you just drop on a counter and it lasts forever. But for me, I mean, I think really the, the main factor in how long it lasts is, I mean, it really is water quality. I mean, that just really destroys everything. And, you know, it's a customer maintaining it as well. But it's, for me, I see the lifespan as directly related to water quality. Okay. Mike Kahn has a really good question. Um, with the rise in the number of modular super automatics, do you think that there is a critical number of machines which will allow you to have spare modules so you can repair and maintain offsite or will the cost of spare modules always make this approach prohibitive? Let's start with you, Mark. Uh, I think that's where we're going. Um, I, I don't think that it's prohibitive if you have a program in place um, on there because it saves me a lot of time uh, to do it that way. Um, the customer still pays for the services um, for that. And we can also go through and see, you know, if there's any issues with modules that maybe we're missing, like, you know, there's a particular seal that leaks or perhaps there's something that we can address, um, you know, uh, over time to eliminate something. It gives us, you know, like I was talking, you know, like, uh, uh, like I told Kurt there, you know, if we could go in and see it every three months, a traditional machine, you know, you could save them a lot of headaches. It's the same thing with the modular system. If you can get a hold of that module and look at it and review it. Um, you know, you can save yourself a lot of grief uh, as far as long term, you know, or issues that will exasperate over time when it really is a small steam leak. But I do see it going. I'll be interested to see when that technology uh, falls into the uh, traditional machine market. Uh, there will be a day I feel that you will be able to go into a traditional machine and with a couple snaps, pull out an entire steam boiler and drop a new one in. I, I think that that's going to happen. Matt. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, I think the modular side of things is wonderful, um, especially when you're running into really mysterious electrical things. Um, that really helps a lot to be able to, to figure that out. Now, there's a lot of questions I have surrounding, like, how would we get there? Like, I start to think that route, but I, I think having them on hand is really helpful in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think just being able to think that way and to operate that way, it really helps save time. I'd love to see where that's going in the future. I don't really know where that's going to be heading, but uh, I'm excited to see if there's any changes to the traditional side of things. That would kind of kind of blow my mind, to be honest with you. I would be. I, I have to say, seeing traditionals as a more modular unit would be very cool. I've seen test units where they've made the pump. I've seen you know I've seen test units demonstrated with a pump system, and the and the and the group head system is modular, but I've never seen it done effectively. Kurt, your thoughts? Um, I think the concept of just having the modulars cost effective for commercial accounts is great. Because um, typically the commercial accounts, you're trying to rush in and swap out all that somehow and get out of their way pretty quickly. Um, private accounts, I don't see it being very cost effective for them. Um, private accounts, I think it's more worthwhile for them to spend their money on a second machine so if one goes down, uh, your tech can get out there and you as the tech can get out there and fix the broken machine while they're using that machine. I mean, why would they spend the money for your or for them to have a spare module sitting on your shelf at your shop for them when they could spend maybe 30%, 40% more just to have that module or to have a second machine? It's kind of what I look at it as for the private side of it. So Mike Kahn makes an interesting, an interesting point is that we do see the technology out there with the modular machine with Modbar. So, and I, I, I didn't want to bring that out there because there is a couple, there is a couple of machines there that we have seen. I did break the rule there. Sorry about that, guys. Um, <laughs> Tom Berquist has an interesting, um, an interesting question. Um, so I own a machine, you come in and take my 50,000 cycle module, PM it and give it to someone else. You give me a 100,000 cycle PM module, is that fair? Basically the no. question is, is it fair to be recycling? <laughs> well, that's where I go into, I don't think that's right for private. That's what I'm saying for the commercial okay. accounts, I think that's perfectly fine. But for private, I don't agree with that. I'm with Don on that one, to be honest. Okay, so do you buy modules? that you set aside for your specific customers? These modules are for this customer and their machines? I encourage them to buy the, uh, to buy a second machine is what I encourage them to buy. Okay. 
Um, looks like we lost Matt. Um, one question from this person actually left, but this is a really good question. Um, well, actually, Matt, I'm, I'm, Matt, Mark, let's hear what you, you have to say on that. Sorry. On the oh, as far as giving Donna a uh, uh, hundred thousand shot uh, module, I'd give it to that guy all day long. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kurt's right. I mean, each. I mean, if you're talking a corporate environment, that's a different scenario. Um, if you're talking a you know a one off or a guy with you know or a person, sorry, with uh, three stores, you know maybe you could uh, you know maybe you could do a module uh, uh, swap with that. But if, I mean, if you're just if you have one person with one drive through. You know, it's probably easier just to repair that module um, on demand or through a preventive maintenance program. And, you know, you just have to schedule that with them uh, on there. But, it, it, but for the uh, commercial environment, it, it certainly works because they don't care if it's, you know, if you got something with 50,000 shots and then you, you know, you rebuild it. Really, your, your, your shot issue is, you know, the motor, how long the motor's been running. And uh, obviously they have a certain lifespan, but, but they actually run pretty long. So. Um, but 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 I agree with Kurt on the on the on the module part of it uh, for a smaller a smaller account it's not worth it. Matt. Yeah, um, sorry I dropped out there. My wife and I did. But um, yeah, I think what Kurt's saying is great. I, the reality is is that uh, some of these uh, shops are are running two units already as well. Like the way that the bar flow goes, depending on their you know how many customers are actually getting through in a day. Um, and their traffic, like they will have a, a two group, like two two groups, um, or two single groups, even depending on how they want to run their their flow. Um, so that's something that I think that people are already considering just for bar flow sake as well. Um, and so I think really that boils down to what what is it for you and where you are, you know, and like if it makes sense to to pursue that, like what Kurt was saying, getting a second unit of some sort to be able to make sure that it's up and running like that that is a cost but at the same time like i think for commercial side of things versus um like your shop down the road like there probably is right. significances for sure we have a couple additional comments um from water water god scott manley um when you are swapping mods you're affecting the capital value of the equipment this is an accounting issue that one large company encountered that's actually he brings up a good point about the capital value of the equipment because you're not you're not trading like for like if you're doing it where I'm going to trade you what I have in stock. Then Mike Kahn brings up a point. He wants our thoughts on this is the way I would do it is to have a spare module of my own, swap it into the failed machine, fix their module in the service vehicle and swap them back. But that puts the cost on the tech. What are our thoughts on that? Let's start with you, Matt. Yeah, and that's the things that I was processing through earlier is that I've I've always had the ability to do that from a tech side, from my side of things never really having the, the cost be on the customer side of things either. And, um, you know, from a technician perspective, I think that's really, um, that's really interesting to approach. I don't know how that would work long-term with billing and how that would pan out between the customer. Um, I, I feel like that's more manageable, especially for the customer side of things, but you'd have to make it make sense for your business as well from the technician um okay. things too because i mean if you only have one of them it doesn't really add up you know long term uh, if you have multiple where they're running the same units i mean that's when it starts to make sense a lot more as well and yeah you know, as far as uh, losing value um, that's a really interesting aspect as well when you're swapping like for like when that's not necessarily like for like as well um yeah it's a good point um and you're feeling mark uh, I think it, again, we'll go back to Kurt. I mean, it's just, there, you're talking about two different environments on there. You know, it, it's, it's nice. I have, I have modules um, for, for any machine that is modular. I'm lucky enough to have them. You know, they're not brand new, but we don't do the swap with those. We do them as a loaner. Um, so we'll put it in. I don't necessarily fix it on the truck. We'll bring it back to the shop because it's a little bit easier to do it. And then we'll go in and insert it later. You know, it's really just a selling point on our service. You know, if, you know, if they had to choose between the, the three of us on a particular machine and Kurt had a module and said, hey, I'll loan you my module and then I'll repair it and you'll never be down. Well, they're going to go with Kurt, okay. you know, so I think it's, you know, it's 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 a probably a business decision as far as devaluing the machine again, you know, this on a corporate environment. And, and just to be clear, nobody's doing this yet. 
I mean, we were talking about where, where it might be headed. No, nobody for the most part is doing massive module swaps here and there um, on there, except like in a, in an emergency case, like with Matt was saying, when you have a, when, when you have a, 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 an electrical gremlin in there, you can't figure out, you know, you got to put a new module in there to, to figure it out. And if it works, sometimes you're like, okay, let's not break it again. And you leave it in there as far as a devaluation. I mean, that's really a more of an accounting thing. I mean, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the life of the machine, I think, value-wise, I think you know one of the bigger customers or one of the bigger chains, they value it at ten years um, over that period. But I think more importantly for them is how much money can it generate during that time. So I don't think they, you know, again from an accounting standpoint, if if we're bean counters, that's that's somebody else's problem, not mine. Right. Uh, but I'm, you know, but but you know, a customer is really interested in this thing needs to generate revenue and whatever it takes to get it up and going. I'm I'm happy to to live with. Um, that's, I mean, it's, it's an excellent question and it, Scott's, Scott's emailing me about the, um, one of the companies that we work with about rebuilding an, an offsite shop. I, I honestly think we could have an episode about the accounting and Eversys systems, but let's go to the last question that was on the sheet is if I'm a tech and I'm, I'm coming up as a tech, what, how, it's a broad question. What do I need to know? Let's do top five. What do I need to know to learn how to work on super automatics? Because like with a traditional system, you really need to know pressure. You really need to understand pressure and you really need to understand water quality. And you really need to understand how extraction works. What do I need to know as a tech because you're dealing with a big box full of hot water and electronics. What do I need to know as a tech to learn how to work on super automatics? Matt, let's start with you. Yeah, I think it's, I don't know if it's a whole lot different um, than it would be for traditionals. I think you still, I think no matter what kind of tech you are, I think you still need to know, like you're mentioning Highland, um, water in general is huge. And Mark had mentioned it already earlier, like water quality is, is massive. If you don't understand how water is impacting your systems um, and you're not able to convey that to your customers, then that's going to play a huge factor in the, the lifespan of those boilers and you know anything else that's going on within that unit. So I'd say water uh, electrical uh, is huge too. If you don't understand how electrical works, how it gets shifted around, what a transformer does, those kind of things. So like that's really helpful to understand how power is shifted in between a super auto. Um, so it might play a little bit bigger of a of a factor in some super autos, even though the basics really are the same. I mean, you still have relays, you still have all these different items that could be sitting in a traditional, depending on the manufacturer. But I think understanding wiring diagrams too and understanding what that means, being able to read one, uh, I think that's super helpful. And we'll touch base on that a little bit on this capacitor thing coming up here in the future. Um, but uh, those are just my two. I'll, I'll give the other three to the other guys. Thanks for the plug on the Ask an Expert Pro. I, I really appreciate that. Um, well, well, you know, me and Don and me and Don and Mike Tian do it during our What If Tech Needs to Know for Electrical, and we really discuss the needs to know about that stuff. And one of the things that Mike brings up is you really have to understand how wires work and wiring size, because that hasn't that. If you don't understand how that works, then you can really make a mess putting the wrong wiring size in. Kurt, I'm going to go to you next. Um, mechanical. Um, functionality is a big thing. If you can't understand how a motor spinning one gear, a smaller gear to a larger gear will change the speeds or um, how mechanical and electrical work together. So um, just like, uh, I won't go too far, just the current draw on motors can change what it's doing. So like if, uh, the motor draws too much current. It goes, oh, I'm done. I know it to stop now. Right. This this goes back to what our group's been discussing about the pro series is is going into really big details. And I think as we're discussing this, one of the things that we will be discussing in the future is the in depth on motors and capacitors and the electronics because you could really spend an hour discussing. We're going to spend well, an hour yeah, discussing capacitors. But I'm just referring to the the interaction between the electrical right. and the mechanical. I'm a very much mechanical um when i'm diagnosing i i actually don't use it very much 
electrically, unless I'm just talking like elements or capacitors. I can do most of my diagnosing through mechanical capabilities. So okay. just to standard mechanical functions. Is that's a good saying. point. That's a very that's a very good point though. Thank you. Mark, your thoughts? I think it's if you can work on a traditional uh, again, like Kurt said, you have to have you know some mechanical aptitude, um, and then uh, you know if you and, and he's I think he was trying to say a nice way of have some common sense, um, you know, is how <laughs> of how things should work. Uh, you know, if 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 A affects B, which equals C, if if A is not A, then you don't get C. So I think that's part of it. I think uh, another aspect of it is you know you have to be able to um, you know they have to be able to talk to tech support um i think that's i think that's one area that we we sort of forget about i know i do where i just assume if if they've kind of got some you know they can use a meter uh and they've got a good understanding of the machine you know when you're talking to tech support they forget that you're talking to somebody completely blind like they don't they don't understand what you're talking about sometimes because you can't articulate what it is you're looking at or what the problem is and so when I'm talking to my guys and, and gals, you know, it really is, I don't mean to be rude, but when I ask you questions, I just want a yes or no, and don't do anything in between that until I figure out where you're at. So I think that's right. part of it is, is being able to talk tech support and then being able to listen to tech support and do exactly what they say. I, it's, it's, something that, it's something that has been problematic with us um, on there because, um, you know, that's just, I don't, I don't know, and I don't know how to, to teach that, but it's really, I guess, listening. But but you have to have all the basics. I mean, you have to be mechanical. You have to know how to use a meter, um, e even if it's just diagnosing elements um, on there. So you know, I think it's you know, if you can, if 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 you can work on cars, you can work on express machines. You have you have that mentality, I think, and it's it's a particular person that it is. Right. Yeah, oh, I like that, Mark. I I think you hit the nail on the head there. If you have the understanding of the technical side of things, but you lack the communication side of things, there's still gonna be a gap in between because being able to do this job, I think is twofold. You have to have the understanding and you have to have the ability to communicate and listen and be able to communicate yourself too. So I think that's excellent. I think one of the points that you all three bring up is about the communication. And as a, as a service manager, one of the things I find because I work with both in-house techs and third-party techs, contractors, what I find is the customer is not going to call the, the technician and ask him what what was the issue and what was established. They're going to call me or Kurt or Mark and say what was wrong. And I think we're one of the focuses that on training and I think super automatics in a lot of ways you really need it is the communication that you're teaching the tech is getting the right amount of detail and, and accuracy on the detail so you can interpret that detail to the customer. And that's so many times I read machine was broken i fixed it like i can't tell you how many times i can say if i had a nickel <laughs> or or i replaced this part it's like okay that's great so we just went back out there because the part had been had failed so i need to know why you replaced the part what did you determine that you replaced the part um let's see if there's any more questions and we will wrap this up um <laughs> i gotta put this in from my con again uh, i know a tech who lost a finger in a super automatic automatic this is one difference it's much less likely to happen on a traditional machine. I, think now, a couple I, have, a, story. I, have, a, I have a similar story. Is there's one there's one customer that has that that a hot block for their espresso machine. Even when you when you turn the machine off and you, you disconnect it, that hot block stays super hot for a really long time. And I think I've touched that thing about six thousand times. Literally, I have not learned my lesson. <laughs> so we're gonna wrap it up, gentlemen. Um, Next week's Ask the Expert is what a tech needs to know about electrical and electricity. It's an extension of an Ask the Expert Pro series with me and Don Berquist. It will be a panel, which I might be getting some of you guys in there. It'll be Friday at 8. I want to thank Mark and your company for providing the time to, to join us today. Kurt, I want to thank you and Last Man for providing the time to join us today and answer the questions. Matt, I'd like to thank you and Vixo for providing the time. And I am Highland Joseph, and I'd like to thank Espresso Partners for providing the time. If you have any questions, my email is on the questions and it was on the, on the um, presentation. Please feel free to email out to me. I will refer it to the presenter and we can get you a copy of the presentation. Other than that, gentlemen, have a great weekend and we'll see you next week. Bye, Bye guys. Thanks, guys.